On a quiet Sunday afternoon in 1974, a fully loaded DC-10 took off from Paris and vanished from radar just minutes later. No mayday, no warning, just silence, followed by wreckage scattered across the Ermenonville forest. What brought Turkish Airlines Flight 981 down wasn't a storm, a hijacking or sabotage, it was a cargo door, a flaw so avoidable it had already nearly killed before. And yet nothing had changed. This wasn't just a mechanical failure, it was a global wake-up call that exposed deadly cracks in the aviation system. And it all started with one overlooked latch in Paris. So, why did McDonnell Douglas allow the DC-10 to keep flying with a known design flaw? And how did a cargo door lead to the deadliest crash in French aviation history? In this video, we will break down the true story of Flight 981, from the warning signs ignored to the explosive final minutes, and how this tragedy reshaped the skies forever. Let's dive in. March 3, 1974 began like any ordinary travel day at Paris's Orly Airport. Turkish Airlines Flight 981 was on the tarmac, set to continue its journey from Istanbul to London with a stopover in Paris. The aircraft chosen for the job was a McDonnell Douglas DC-10-10, tail number TCJAV, named Ankara. It was a relatively new plane, delivered to Turkish Airlines just two months earlier in December 1973. Built for long-haul comfort, the DC-10 was the pride of modern aviation at the time with its wide-body design and triple-engine configuration. But beneath that sleek surface, the DC-10 had already earned a controversial reputation, which we will get to in a few. Flight 981 was unusually packed. Turkish Airlines had recently signed a codeshare deal with Air France to serve passengers between Paris and London. But on this day, an Air France strike forced many travelers to be rebooked onto Flight 981. The result, 346 people on board, 333 passengers, and 13 crew, making it the deadliest commercial flight in history at that time. Among the passengers were tourists, students, and families returning from holidays. A large number were French citizens. The majority were seated in the rear economy section, directly above the cargo hold. The crew operating the flight included experienced professionals. Captain Najat Berkoz had over 7,000 hours of flight time. First Officer Orhan Uzturk and Flight Engineer Mohamed Mahmoudi were also highly trained. Mahmoudi, in particular, was responsible for verifying that the cargo door was properly locked during boarding. He followed protocol, checked the external indicators, and believed everything was secure. But the locking mechanism, if not properly latched, could still show a locked signal even when it wasn't. What no one saw coming was that this stopover in Paris would become the most tragic leg of the journey. The plane took off at 12.32 p.m. local time, climbing steadily through a clear afternoon sky. 11 minutes later, everything changed. So what exactly happened in those final moments? At 12.32 p.m., Turkish Airlines Flight 981 lifted off from Paris Orly Airport, heading northwest toward London. The DC-10 climbed smoothly through 10,000 feet, then continued toward its cruising altitude. For the next nine minutes, everything appeared routine. Passengers were settling in, the crew was conducting checks, and the cabin was quiet. Then, at 12.40 p.m., exactly eight minutes and 40 seconds after takeoff, a violent blast shattered the silence. The cargo door on the rear left side of the aircraft tore open without warning. The explosive decompression that followed was instantaneous. The cabin floor above the cargo hold collapsed downward, pulling six passengers seated near the brake directly into the cargo bay and out of the aircraft. In less than two seconds, the rear of the fuselage buckled. Rows of seats detached, screams filled the air, oxygen masks dropped, and loose objects became deadly projectiles. The shockwave ripped open parts of the fuselage, and fragments of insulation and luggage trailed the aircraft as it screamed forward. More critically, the collapsing floor severed the control cables running from the cockpit to the tail section. 
the elevator's rudder and engine two throttle were now unresponsive. The flight crew immediately knew something catastrophic had occurred. The pilots struggled to command the aircraft, but their controls were limp. The plane was flying on momentum alone. No vertical steering, no rudder, and only partial engine control. The aircraft began a shallow but uncontrolled descent. Inside the cockpit, alarms were going off in rapid succession. One of the loudest was the overspeed warning, triggered by the sudden drop in altitude. The DC-10 was descending too fast, pushing against its structural limits. Despite this, the cockpit voice recorder revealed no Mayday call. The radio fell silent. Investigators later concluded that the radio wiring had likely been severed when the floor collapsed, cutting off communication entirely. The crew held on for nearly four minutes, trying everything to stabilize the aircraft. They managed to level the wings briefly, but with no elevators and no rudder, the plane kept pitching nose down and accelerating. At 12.44 p.m., traveling at over 480 knots, Flight 981 plowed into the Ermenonville Forest, northeast of Paris. The force of the impact disintegrated the aircraft on contact, creating a crater and scattering debris across a mile-wide radius. Everyone on board, 346 people, was killed instantly. The crash site left investigators stunned, but what they uncovered next was even more disturbing. There had been warnings, clear ones, and the company behind the aircraft had known about the cargo door's flaws for years. So let's look into how the design was allowed to fly despite those red flags. The cargo door design of the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 was a known weak point long before Flight 981 took off from Paris. In 1972, American Airlines Flight 96, another DC-10, narrowly avoided a similar disaster when its rear cargo door blew open mid-flight over Windsor, Canada. The explosive decompression ripped part of the floor, severed control cables, and left the aircraft crippled. The only reason Flight 96 landed safely was due to sheer luck, quick thinking by the pilots, and the fact that the plane wasn't at full capacity. This incident should have been a turning point, forcing a complete redesign of the cargo door system. Instead, McDonnell Douglas opted for quick fixes and minor adjustments and issued service bulletins instead of mandatory structural changes. The problem was rooted in how the DC-10's cargo door latched shut. Unlike passenger doors, which open inward and are pressurized to remain sealed, the DC-10's cargo door opened outward. To secure it, a series of hooks and rotating latch cams had to engage correctly, but the system allowed for a dangerous scenario. The door's external handle could be forced into the locked position even if the latches weren't fully engaged. Ground crews could look at the indicator and believe the door was sealed when it wasn't. This design flaw created a hidden failure point that was almost impossible to detect without additional safety mechanisms. After the near disaster of Flight 96, the FAA and multiple engineers raised alarms. A formal recommendation was made to redesign the cargo door with stronger locking mechanisms and an additional vent to prevent catastrophic decompression. Internal memos surfaced years later, showing that both McDonnell Douglas and the FAA were aware of the dangers, but the fixes were considered costly and time-consuming. Airlines were instead told to install viewing windows and placards as a temporary measure, leaving the core design untouched. Many planes, including the DC-10 that would become Flight 981, had only partial modifications. Whistleblowers within the industry warned that the system remained vulnerable. In one case, engineers suggested an electric actuator that would make improper latching physically impossible, but this was dismissed as unnecessary at the time. By 1974, the DC-10 fleet was flying with the same design flaw that had almost killed everyone on Flight 96. Flight 981 would prove to be the breaking point but it came at the cost of 346 lives. So when investigators completed digging through the wreckage of Flight 981, the report didn't just point fingers at McDonnell Douglas. It called out regulatory agencies, airline procedures, and training standards. The cracks in the system weren't isolated, they were everywhere. 
and they had all contributed to the worst aviation disaster France had ever seen. With the truth exposed, the pressure was on. Airlines had to act fast. The public wanted answers, and regulators were under fire. What came next wasn't just about fixing a door, it was about reshaping how the entire aviation industry dealt with risk. So, let's look at how Flight 981 forced change around the world. When the final report on Turkish Airlines Flight 981 was released, it was a reckoning. The crash had wiped out 346 lives in seconds, and the industry knew it couldn't treat this as just another isolated tragedy. The fallout was immediate. British Airways, which operated a fleet of DC-10s through a lease agreement, grounded its aircraft within days. Other carriers followed suit. Confidence in the DC-10 was in freefall, and passengers were openly refusing to fly on the model. Airport ticket counters were flooded with rerouting requests from travelers who simply didn't trust the plane anymore. Regulators scrambled. The Federal Aviation Administration issued emergency airworthiness directives, forcing airlines to install full mechanical lockout mechanisms on DC-10 cargo doors. This meant that the external handle physically couldn't be moved unless every latch was fully secured. Electric actuators, once considered an optional upgrade, became mandatory. Design improvements also extended to the floor structure, reinforcing it against future decompression events. Every DC-10 worldwide had to go through these changes before returning to full service. Training also came under sharp review. Ground crews received mandatory retraining focused on cargo door verification procedures and new visual inspection systems were adopted to remove reliance on flawed indicators. Airlines were required to add checklists and enforce double sign-off protocols when securing doors. These reforms weren't cosmetic, they were baked into everyday operations with the aim of never letting a failure like this slip through again. For McDonnell Douglas, the damage was more than technical, it was reputational. The company had already been viewed with caution after the American Airlines Flight 96 incident. Now, with 981, many believed the manufacturer had prioritized production deadlines over passenger safety. Though the DC-10 remained in service for decades, it never fully escaped the shadow of Flight 981. Airlines began turning to rivals like Boeing and Airbus for future orders, and the DC-10's legacy became one marked as much by controversy as by its capabilities. So, what are your thoughts on this forgotten disaster? And have we truly done enough to prevent the next one? Or are there still silent design flaws hiding in today's airliners, waiting for their turn? Drop your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more deep dives into aviation's most shocking moments. Until next time, safe travels.